So between 1966 and roughly late 70s, I had about 20 successful flights from the United States, from Canada, and many from Australia. Now, we also had some problems. We had some bad luck. Uh, twice during my flights, the balloons popped. 70,000 feet, there's the tropopause. It's very cold, minus 70 degrees. And there are jet winds, and they beat on the balloon, and then the balloon can burst. And when that happens, we don't have enough time to terminate the flight. We can't separate the parachute from the balloon. It happens all of a sudden. And then, in general, the parachute gets entangled, and then you get a free fall. So the payload is entirely destroyed, and that happened twice. But we were lucky enough that at several occasions we made some interesting discoveries. Uh, during the early years of X-ray astronomy, we discovered five new X-ray sources, and some of these sources that we saw from balloons were highly variable. We noticed an, an X-ray flare. The X-ray intensity went up by a factor of three or four on as little time as 10 minutes. And that was completely new in those days, and that could not have been discovered from rockets because the rockets themselves are only five minutes above the Earth's atmosphere, and they're not looking at one source all the time. They are scanning the sky because their objective was to find as many X-ray sources as they could. But we were up sometimes 26 hours, so we had plenty of time to look at one portion of the sky for a long time, for hours on. And so it was not an accident that we discovered these flaring events which lasted up to 10 minutes and longer. We also discovered an object which we called GX1 plus 4. The number has to do with where it is in the sky. And we noticed, much to our surprise, that the X-rays seemed to fluctuate in a periodic fashion, 2.3 minutes. At the time, we had no clue what that meant, but later, as you will see very shortly, it became clear that that was the rotation period of a neutron star. So the big question was in the early days, what are these objects? And this is something that we have discussed in 801, and I will go over it very briefly again, but we discussed it, and you even had some homework problems on it. These objects are X-ray binaries, whereby one object is very compact, which could be a neutron star, or in some cases even a black hole, and the other object, the other star, is a normal nuclear burning star, something like our sun. And they are very close together. They are so close together that the matter which is here is attracted by the neutron star stronger than that it is attracted by the star itself, and so it starts to find its way to the neutron star. This is a binary system, so they go around each other. This matter cannot just go in radially, but it would spiral in slowly and find its way to the neutron star, strangely enough that we still don't understand how it makes it, but it does make it ultimately to the neutron star, and this is then what we call the accretion disk. This is the accretor, and this is the donor. The donor provides the fuel that finds its way to the neutron star. And if you take a little bit mass m, and you drop that on a neutron star, the neutron star has mass capital M, say, and radius capital R, then the kinetic energy that is released at impact is something that all of you should be able to do. That is the following, mmg divided by R equals one-half mv squared. This is the gravitational potential energy that becomes available if an object of mass little m crashes onto the star, the surface of the star has a radius capital R, the mass of the star is capital M. And that is converted to kinetic energy, which is one-half mv squared, so this is the speed at impact. Of course, it's always independent of little m, and so you can calculate that speed, and that speed is horrendous for a neutron star. The reason being that the radius of the neutron star is so absurdly small, it's only ten kilometers. It is, um, roughly 100,000 times smaller than the radius of our sun. The mass of the neutron star is comparable to that of our sun. A little larger, but it's comparable. But it is the radius which is so small, and that's why you get a huge speed at impact, which is about half the speed of light. And this um, kinetic energy is converted to heat for the same reason that when we drop something here on the floor, that the kinetic energy ultimately goes into heat. 
And so it heats up the surface layers of the neutron star and the temperature becomes horrendously high, ten to the seven, ten to the eight degrees, ten million, hundred million degrees. And at that very high temperature, almost all the energy, almost all electromagnetic radiation comes out in the form of X-rays. The sun has a temperature of only six thousand degrees. Most of it comes out in the form of optical light. But when you go to ten million degrees, that's no longer the case. The spectrum shifts in favor of the X-rays. The amount of energy that is released is horrendous. To give you some feeling for that, if you take a marshmallow and you throw a marshmallow from a large distance onto a neutron star, then the energy that is released, which is this energy, is comparable to the energy that was released of the atomic bomb that was thrown on Hiroshima. So that tells you something about the enormous gravitational forces that are at work on the surface of a neutron star. We know now what these systems are. The evidence is overwhelming. We have observed the rotation of the neutron stars, the 2.3 minutes that we found we now know is the rotation of the neutron star. These neutron stars have a strong magnetic field and the matter that accretes onto the neutron star reaches the magnetic poles. In 802 you will see, you will learn why this plasma, which is highly ionized, why that cannot just reach the neutron star anywhere, but it is forced to only enter the neutron star near the magnetic poles. And if the neutron star rotates, then the magnetic poles can rotate like this. And when you are on Earth, you see X-rays, 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 no X-rays, X-rays, and so you see pulsations. And so these pulsations have been seen from many neutron stars now, from many of these binary systems. It's very clear that it's a binary system. Uh, if you are in the plane or near the plane of the orbits of the two stars, then the neutron star can go behind the donor and then you don't see any X-rays because the X-rays are then absorbed by the donor and then you see an X-ray eclipse, so the X-rays vanish. So you would see the pulsations, strong X-ray signal and all of a sudden, boom, it's gone. And then a few hours later it starts up again when the neutron star reappears, reemerges from the donor star. So that picture is all very clear, but I do want to show you at least uh, a sketch of what we think such a system would look like, which is just the next slide and maybe the person in the booth, oh, I can do it from here. So this is what it sort of looks like. You see the donor there on the left and you see here the, the neutron star or it could be a black hole. That's sort of the same idea, you would not be able to tell. And you see how the matter swirls in. Of course, this is not a real picture, this is a sketch made by an illustrator. We know many hundreds of these systems in our own galaxy and of course there are many in other galaxies as well.